In this video, I'll introduce you to an easy to play multiphonic that can be played by anyone. I'll also give some interesting ways in which we can play multiphonics. And finally, I'm going to offer some help to composers when writing with multiphonics. So firstly, what is a multiphonic? Well, a saxophone is a monophonic instrument, which means it can only play one note at a time, and it can't play chords like a piano or a guitar can. But a multiphonic, as the name suggests, is playing more than one sound at the same time. And we achieve this by splitting the instrument into sections. We do this by opening certain keys at certain points, and this then tricks the instrument into thinking it's playing more than one note at the same time. On top of this, we have some of the fingerings that access some overtones in the sound, which will give us multiple sounds on top of the couple of sounds that the saxophone actually thinks it's playing. Now, when you're playing a multiphonic, I don't want you thinking that you're suddenly going to be able to play chords like you can on the piano or the guitar. In most cases, you're not going to be playing well-defined and in-tune sets of notes. The sound is likely to be a strange and actually untuneful noise, but actually with careful control from the player and clever writing from a composer, they can actually produce some very interesting sounds that can enhance the music that's being played. Let's start with a simple one. I want you to finger a low C and it doesn't matter which instrument you've got in your hands, this is a great one for any saxophone. Finger that low C and take off your F finger, which is the first finger on your right hand, and just push some air through and see what happens. You should get this sound. Like I said before, they're going to sound very, very strange. It's not going to sound like normal sounds on the saxophone. Now to achieve that, you might find that there's a little bit of resistance to start with. You might get this sound. And that's absolutely normal. What I want you to do is push through that resistance. You might want to just put a little bit more pressure on your reed by bringing up your bottom jaw. So I actually arch my tongue quite a little bit there and I actually aim quite high in the sound. The other thing that's great about this multiphonic is we can actually hear what's going on. We can actually pinpoint the different notes just by a little manipulation of the embouchure and the airstream and we can hear which notes are actually appearing in that multiphonic. So what we're actually hearing is this. <laughs> Those are the three prominent notes within that multiphonic, and they are kind of a low F sharp, a high G with your octave key on, and finally a high C sharp with your octave key on. And now you will have heard there that they're not exactly in tune with the proper fingering on the instrument. And that's where you're going to get a little bit of discrepancy in the tuning. I think that's one of the reasons why this sounds like such an odd sound. It certainly doesn't sound like those intervals or those notes that I've told you stacked on top of each other. That crunch of the funny tuning within the multiphonic is what gives us that funny sound. <laughs> So less experienced players are very unlikely to come across multiphonics in the music that they're learning, but it's actually quite good fun to go out and make some of these silly noises. So just experiment, just try different fingering combinations, take the odd finger off, add the odd side key here and there, and just see what sounds you actually can produce using these multiphonics. Now some of the interesting ways that we can produce multiphonics, I'm going to give you a few ways that we can play them. One way that I quite like playing them and I quite like writing for them is combining the multiphonic with a slap tongue. So you can hear there it's quite a percussive sound and, and you're getting different m overtones within that sound that really really brings that sound to life. Experiment with that sound, see what you can produce with the different multiphonics. It's a great way to add a little bit of a percussive sound to a composition. The other thing to highlight is that actually you can get quite a delicate sound with these multiphonics, and some of them do sound very, very nice when they're played with that really soft sound. <laughs> And finally, one of my favourite, the morphing multiphonic. And this is where the multiphonic can appear little by little, and you can build the chord up as you're moving along through the note. Mm -hmm. 
For those more advanced players that are probably learning music that has multiphonics in it, you're probably going to get asked to play specific sounds in your multiphonics by a composer. Now, a thorough composer will have done their homework and offer you a fingering for that multiphonic. And if that composer is really on it, then they will also reference the book that they've taken that fingering from. It's often really useful for the player to look that fingering up themselves because more often than not, these multiphonics don't work the same on all instruments. And I'm not saying the alto saxophone and the tenor saxophone here. I'm talking about different makes of instruments. Different makes of instruments can have an impact on the way that multiphonic is produced and also the way that the performer is going to play it. The other thing that can impact it is your mouthpiece, your reed, your ligature setup. All of that can have an impact on how that multiphonic is produced, how easy you're able to play it, how certain notes are going to be highlighted in that multiphonic. So it's really important to have a reference to where that multiphonics come from so the performer can look it up for themselves and possibly try some other alternatives to make it more successful. This is the book that I use pretty much exclusively now for the work that I do on multiphonics for both as a performer and a composer. It's a very, very thorough book. You can see the thickness of that there and all of it is just filled with different multiphonics for all instruments from sopranino sax all the way down to baritone sax. Now the thing I really like about this book is it gives you quite a lot of information on that multiphonic. There are different columns here. It gives you the notes that appear in the multiphonic in concert pitch and also what it sounds like for the performer's written notation, really useful for composers. It gives you uh, a rhythm that you're able to play as well, so how fast you're able to play this multiphonic. Some of them are quite tricky to produce, especially when your tongue is starting to be introduced, so re-articulating that note can be quite tricky. This gives you the fastest rhythm that you might be able to play it, but also the dynamics that you're going to be able to play at that rhythm. The next column has your fingers. There's a very useful fingering chart at the beginning of this book, and you just line up the fingers with that fingering chart and the multiphonic should come out. The next column across here is quite an interesting one and this is all of the multiphonics that you can actually line up against this multiphonic that is labelled here. And what that might mean is that it's an easy one finger wise to move between or it's an easy one to achieve because what's going on with your embouchure, your breath control, um, your tongue position, all of that is very similar to all of these multiphonics as well so you can put them quite closely together. The next column is which notes appear in that multiphonic and at which dynamic. This is a really interesting one. If a composer is writing specifically for harmony in mind, then they want that specific note to come out more than others. Well, this column here gives you that information. It tells you which notes are more prominent than others, and that might be a decision that you make for a harmonic reason within your writing. The final column I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail this one. I call this the morphing multiphonics. This is moving between different notes of the multiphonic, picking out certain notes and moving it into a chord and then back again if you wish. I have two main suggestions for composers when they're writing with multiphonics. The first is not to be too precious about the sound. And that might be that you want to use the multiphonic for uh, to have more of an impact of the sound that's actually being produced. So it's a certain sound world decision. It's a certain effect that causes a little bit more of a reaction from the audience. And the other approach is to be very, very specific with what you are after. And that's the reason why you're using that multiphonic. Is it for a harmonic reason? Is it, And is that harmon harmonic reason within what the performer is actually playing? So is it a melodic reason or is it because the harmony of that multiphonic is interacting with another part within an ensemble. Just bear in mind that not always that tuning is going to be accurate. So you're going to get that discrepancy between the tuning in a multiphonic and the tuning with another performer in an ensemble. You should also think quite carefully about how you're notating your multiphonics. It could be that you want that specific note to be highlighted, so you want to notate it slightly differently. That's the important note of this multiphonic. You might only want to notate the certain notes that you want to hear in that multiphonic with a little bit of manipulation from the performer that it is possible to get certain notes within that multiphonic to speak rather than others. And that a book like the Daniel Chienzi book is going to help you with that decision as well. The best piece of advice I can give to composers, particularly for those who are not saxophonists, is speak to a saxophone player just about what is and what isn't possible. 
Ideally, what you want to do is speak or work with the performer that you're writing for, because as I said, every single instrument is different. The setup, the combination of reed, mouthpiece, ligature, the different make, the model of the instrument will have an impact on whether that multiphonic is possible or whether it needs manipulating very, very slightly to the sound that you're after. At that conversation, it's a brilliant idea to bring sketches. It's always great for the performer to have that interactive conversation with a composer to make sure that everybody's life is made easier. The composer knows exactly what's possible by the player and the player feels comfortable that when they actually receive that piece, they're going to be able to play what the composer intends. So I hope you found some of this useful, even if it's just a case of producing a fun sound that you've never produced before and just seeing what way you can incorporate into your playing to make it a little bit more fun. Also, from a composer point of view, if you've got any more questions about writing with Multiphonics, then please do get in touch. I'm more than happy to have that conversation with you to show you what is and isn't possible. And I'd love to have that conversation as well to have other people's ideas of what they want to produce and me to try and find a way of making that work. Thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to this YouTube channel and get over to my website, chrisjolly.com, where are the, there are lots more teaching resources and information on the music that I both write and play. Thanks very much and I'll see you next time.